All right. Good morning again. My name is India Nielsen Barfus. I am a program manager in the Office of Outdoor Recreation, and our director, Pitt Gruy, will be moderating today's discussion about minimum advertised price and third party logistics. Before we get into that, I need to mention just a few housekeeping items. I'm sure everybody's very familiar uh, with these at this point. Um, we're going to be recording this presentation, as I just mentioned. Um, it will be available on YouTube, and we'll send it out later as well. Um, please feel free to share the recording with your network. Um, the goal of today's presentation is really just to, to help folks understand some of these nuances of business. Um, and so we're hoping it will be especially helpful to some of Utah's small businesses or maybe startups. Um, and since we are recording, we're going to be keeping everybody on mute, including for the Q&A. Um, Patrick, will you go ahead and change that last slide? Thank you. This shows you how to use the Q&A chat feature um, if you're not familiar with the, the Google Meet uh, platform. Um, we will be conducting it in the chat. The slide shows you how to use it, of course. We're going to be starting that at about 9.15 a.m., um, but if you have questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to go ahead and put them into the chat, and we'll make sure that we get to those. And um, We will randomly draw the name of somebody who asks a question um, at the end of this presentation, and you can win a cool outdoorsy prize if your name is chosen if you ask a question. Um, that is it for housekeeping, so I will go ahead and turn it over to Pitt, who will introduce today's speakers. Pitt? Thanks, India, and, and welcome everybody on the call. Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, excited to, to talk about this. this. Is you know my background coming from the outdoor industry. This is obviously a hot topic and something that I've spent many hours of my life discussing in boardrooms and meetings with with companies. And and so it's exciting to have these experts here to to kind of guide and give some great recommendations um, about MAP and, and 3PL. So let me introduce our panelists today. Um, we have John Rockefeller. I'll probably refer to him as J Rock throughout this since we have two Johns. Um, but uh, John Rockefeller is the Managing Director of Petzl America Sport Division. So he has 32 years of experience in the outdoor industry. So he includes 10 years in, in retail and sales and management and purchasing um, roles, as well as 22 years in manufacturing and distribution. Um, you know, customer service, sales, marketing, pr product line management, all that goes into uh, the management and, and distribution of a product. Um, J-Rock has worked in the U.S., Canada, and France, and for brands such as Petzl, Arcteryx, and North Face, and Patagonia. So we're uh, lucky to have J-Rock with us here today. Our other panelist is John LeBaron. Um, I've been told, again, that he's often referred to as JLB. So to keep the two Johns straight, we'll have J-Rock and JLB uh, when maybe asking questions or, or referring to them. But uh, John LeBaron is the Chief Revenue Officer for Pattern. Um, John LeBaron oversees the go-to-market activities for the company and its partners. So prior to joining Pattern, um, he ran marketing for the Google Cloud business at Rackspace and has held a variety of global marketing roles with leading tech companies, including Apple, Cisco, Sienna, um, he holds an MBA from Kellogg School of Management, an MSW from Columbia, and a BA in Communication from uh, BYU. So uh, we're lucky to have both Johns here today and their expertise and, and to walk us through this. So thanks so much for being here. So before we jump into the nitty gritty questions and, and you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of acronyms in these things that we're talking about. There's you know, a lot of shortened terms and, and when whatnot. So we thought it'd be a great idea to kind of get a basics around what is MAP and, and, and 3PL and, and what are we actually talking about here and, and, and when we refer to these terms. So I'm going to let J-Rock begin by explaining some basics of, of retail and kind of the process of taking a product to market, um, working with retail partners and, and, and selling direct as well. So um, J-Rock, if you want to, take it over. Thanks, Pitt. Thanks, India. Yeah, you know, good morning, everyone. Uh, we thought, you know, this is a complex discussion around uh, items. It's called MAP, MAP meaning uh, minimum advertised pricing policies, um, and then just kind of marketplaces and 3PL providers. Uh, and so to understand it, we really have to kind of go back to the basics of retail, which is to understand the, the commerce and the, and the ecosystem of commerce. So uh, what slide are we on there? I can't see on my screen, I apologize. I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna start sharing that right now. That would be great.
Perfect. So yeah, I mean, you know, just to start off with, you know, the economy and and retail in general is an ecosystem into itself, and and it's an ecosystem like any other ecosystem, meaning that there are parts of it that when they're healthy and everything is working properly, then the whole system works well. And when parts of the system are out of alignment or there's a challenge in the environment, whether um, there are too many retailers, too many manufacturers, too many points of distribution, uh, too much competition, you can actually create uh, an imbalance in the uh, system itself and actually have a, an unhealthy economic uh, you know, ecosystem. And so in the ecosystem of, of retail in general, you have multiple you know, pieces of that and you have the retailers themselves, the folks that are buying product and reselling it to us as consumers. You have the manufacturers that, who are producing those products. And sometimes you have people in between, which could be distributors in parts of the world that you don't necessarily have offices or distribution. And so there's, there's a, a little bit of um, profitability that needs to be involved in all of those sectors in order for it to be healthy. Uh, and so if we take a look at the basics of it and how important uh, the economy is or the retail is to our economy, next slide please. You'll see that uh, retail itself is actually a fairly significant part of our economy. So this is a, a report from the National Retail Foundation published in July of this year where they talked about over the past six years uh, we've seen a staggering you know, uh, impact in retail. And so specifically retail is 23, has grown from 23% of the employment in the US to 26%. Um, that means roughly one in, in four jobs in the US these days are actually part of the retail ecosystem. Um, it's one of the nation's largest private sector uh, employers in general, um, and it accounts for about 52 million working Americans. Um, as, and as far as GDP, it's about 3.9 trillion annually. And since 2010, retail has been the top contributor to job gains in the economy, accounting for about 15.9% or 28, per, 28 million increase uh, in private sector jobs. So retail itself, when the economy is healthy and when the ecosystem is healthy, is actually a very important part of our economy. Next slide, please. Um, so if we think about like just this is basic math. So for those of you that really understand all the nuances of this, I apologize. But I think it's important to understand kind of the very simplest way to understand the ecosystem of, of the retail sector. So let's just imagine that, um, what, you know, like a lot of people in uh, 2020 decided to go out and run out and buy a bike. If you tried to buy a bike this year, good luck. There's a huge shortage in the marketplace. OK, so let's say you bought you were lucky enough to get a new bike before everybody else bought them and you decided to buy a new helmet. So you looked around and you, you know your favorite Utah uh, bike store, you were able to find your favorite helmet for $60. Next slide, please. So let's look at how that works. So if you're to buy that helmet, by the time you get to the cash register and pay, it's gonna cost you $63.66 here in Salt Lake City if you look at local taxes, right? So the helmet itself costs $60 and the retailer would then spend $3.66 to reimburse uh, for the taxes involved in that sale. Um, they have what's called a COGS or cost of goods sold. That's the cost at which they buy the product from whomever, whether it's a distributor, the manufacturer, et cetera. And so they would pay roughly $33 and that would include uh, their shipping to get the product to them uh, from wherever the product was coming from. So this particular helmet. Um, and then they have what's called an OPEX or an operating expense, right? So you have, if you have a, a retail store, you would have like rent and electricity and you have salaries and, and insurance to pay for. You have advertising costs. You have all of these things that are part of your operating expenses. And so, you know, good businesses can run significantly less than 35%, but you know, on average, about 35% of a retailer's um, uh, cost of goods or, or sale prices revenue would be roughly their opex that's a fairly healthy opex for most retailers and so that would come to about 21 dollars of that sale so if you take the total purchase price of 63 dollars and 66 cents you take out the state and local taxes the cost that they bought the helmet for how much it costs them to open their business and be in business to help sell you that product their profitability if it's a you know a profitable retailer is about 10 percent um, was you know this is earnings before interest and tax that's what EBIT is here and so uh, of that sixty three dollars and sixty six cents they might make six dollars of profit off that helmet um, of note at the bottom of the screen here you know Walmart is probably the world's largest retailer in the world um, one of the you know certainly one of the lowest price places you can go buy product 
Um, in 2019, their sales were $551 billion. They made $31 billion in profit. Um, this is interest before, um, uh, interest before in, uh, sorry, earnings before interest, tax, deductions, and amortization. So fancy financial um, discussions there. But really, their EBIT was roughly 6.13%. So the world's largest retailer was only making about 6% profitability before all of those other elements. Uh, and so a healthy smaller retail might be making 10%. Again, totally different scale. You know, but just to, to kind of get a sense that there's, there's not a huge profitability here. And so when, when you look at how things work, you can see where the pressures will come in later on. So next slide, please. So when you look at the manufacturer of that helmet, so if I'm the manufacturer of that particular bike helmet and I make that helmet uh, and I'm gonna sell it to the retailer for $30, right? Um, so I may or may not have import duties to pay if I'm gonna import that helmet from wherever it's manufactured, let's say, uh, into the US to sell. So um, it, of note, there's been a huge discussion about duties recently, obviously with the um, uh, tariff wars that are going on throughout the world right now. Um, in some products coming into the U.S., duties can be as high as 37% here in the outdoor industry. So in certain products, uh, it can be zero. In the case of a bike helmet, generally it's zero. In certain products, it can be up to 37%. So you may actually have another factor here that's not even part of this particular equation. But in this case, helmets, there's a 0% duty. Uh, you have distribution costs. So if I happen to be a manufacturer or I'm based in a different country and I need to distribute that product here, I have a distributor that needs to be able to manage that um, and ship it to that dealer. So there's, you know, a little bit of money that would go to them. The cost of production, you know, if I'm actually producing it myself, I have to buy raw materials, I have to pay people to put it together, or I might be outsourcing that production. But let's just say it's about $12 in the cost of this. And then, of course, I have operating expenses as a business as well. Uh, and so if we use the same roughly 35%, you can see when I sell that helmet for $30, I'm deducting distribution costs, cost to produce, plus my OPEX. And I'm maybe making $3 if I've got a healthy business and I'm making a 10% EBIT here. So in overall, if you look between the retailer and the manufacturer, there's $9 profit in the $63.66 that you've paid for that helmet by the time you walk out the door. Uh, next slide, please. And so when we talk about MAP, and, and this is a very important and, and tricky topic because it, it does have a lot of implications. And so the source from this is from the FTC. And so we'll talk a little bit about the FTC here. So the FTC was based on um, a congressional law that was first passed in 1890, part of the Sherman Act. And then later on in 1914, the actual FTC Act was created. And in essence, for just layman's terms, the FTC is there to basically, you know, ban unfair methods of competition or unfair or deceptive acts and practices. And so one of the things that was happening that kind of led to this particular act was the fact that um, there was some deceptive kind of, you know, uh, advertising that was going on. And, and we all bump into this every once in a while, right? Like you see some advertised price and you go into the store and by the time you actually get to the register, get to pay for the product, um, there's all these additional things that they've added into the price of the product. And so what was advertised X price by the time you actually pay for it is much higher. And as, as a um, consumer, that can be something very difficult to deal with. Um, some people aren't comfortable challenging those things. And so the FTC kind of stands in as a government um, agency to help kind of protect consumers from unfair practices, okay? Uh, next slide, please. And so what is um, interesting here is that the FTC uh, allows manufacturers to use a program called minimum advertised pricing policies. Um, and, and basically what it can do is it allows us to say, hey, if you're going to sell this product, you can, I can't tell you it can sell it at. Okay, that's anti-competitive and that's antitrust. So I can't tell you exactly what you can sell the product at, but I can indicate that there should be a fair market value that the product is advertised for. So if you're going to advertise the product, we can, we can say, work with the retailer and say, hey, this product should be sold at or advertising, excuse me, at this price. Now, once you walk in the store, once you actually put it in your cart and buy the product, they can sell it to you for whatever price they want it to sell it to you. And that's that's their competitive advantage. Um, and, and so this is a really tricky fine line. And it's something that um, is there to help produce um, a safe uh, environment. So there's no 
uh, deceptive practices on one hand from an antitrust and FTC Act standpoint, but also to protect the ecosystem of retail. And I think that's the, the interesting part of all of this. Uh, next slide, please. And so really what this main, uh, the main benefit for all of us in this particular thing is that when the manufacturers can have a min minimum advertised pricing policy, what it can do is it can eliminate people doing what I mentioned earlier, which is where they advertise, you can buy this product at, at $0. And you get into the store and you're like, okay, I'm gonna buy that product for $0. And they're like, oh, well, but there's a service fee, there's a delivery fee, there's an unpackaging fee. And by the time you get there, you're like, uh, I've already driven all the way across town or I've already you know, committed to buying it from this person. Um, and, and so you feel kind of hoodwinked. And so that minimum advertised pricing policy really kind of eliminates that kind of hoodwinking or feeling as if you've been, you know, sold at a really low price, but when you actually pay for it, um, it comes in much, much higher. And so that's really what this particular um, element is there to do it. And it really helps protect the ecosystem because what we don't, uh, what would be really unhelpful uh, for consumers in general is, if everybody flocked to one retailer to buy their product and that retailer was, was willing to make a penny on every single product they sold. Um, because eventually that's gonna create a system in which nobody wants to compete against that retailer and you create a monopoly, which is another element that's part of the antitrust laws um, that is basically outlawed here in the US. And so, you know, unfortunately the example I, I use often in this is that, you know, I'm a, a Rockefeller Rockefeller was part of the Standard Oil Company, which was considered an antitrust um, violation and a monopoly at one point in time. And so the Rockefeller family controlled the entire oil business from production, drawing it out of the ground, refinement, to distribution, and retail of it. And so it was anti-competitive. There was only one place you could buy your oil at that point in time, and it was from one company, the Standard Oil Company. And so and the government uh, regulation in that manner is actually really helpful to try to make sure there is competition, but we want healthy competition. And so ultimately MAP is really an element and a tool to make sure that there's healthy competition within the marketplace. Next slide, please. And so let's take an example from recent memory, right? So we just came through the Thanksgiving holiday and you can just imagine that you saw an ad to buy that helmet for 10% off in your favorite bike shop. It's like, whoo, Black Friday, I'm gonna get 10% off deal. So let's look at what actually happens now in that actual retail economy. So a 10% discount on a $60 helmet would give you $6 off. So now your purchase price with taxes is $57.31. So, you know, it's interesting we're on a state, you know, call here with the uh, Utah State Group here and their actual revenue now goes down, right? They were making $366 before and now they're only making $331. And so your local and, and state governments now have less revenue to reinvest in things like the outdoor rec department and things like that, right? On top of that, the same cost of goods, the retailer paid the same for that helmet and they have the same operating expenses. So when you look at their bottom line, if their EBIT was 10%, and again, this is simplified math, but the reality is that if they sell that helmet at 10% off at Black Friday, they make zero money on that helmet. So why do retailers do it? Well, because not everything you're going to buy that day from them might be on discount that day. So they, they play what's called a blended margin, right? And so you might have bought that helmet because it was a great deal, but you might have also picked up a water bottle and maybe a bike tube or maybe a tool that wasn't on discount and they actually made their 10% on those other products, right? So you play a blended margin across that. So again, this is a simplified example of it, but you can see that you know if an, an, a healthy EBIT, a healthy, healthy profitability for a retailer is 10%, again, Walmart's making 6%. So the moment that they discount more than what their EBIT is, to a certain extent, they start to lose money. Now, again, there are, there's blended margins, there's a lot of other elements part of this, but just simple math, it just helps to understand that if it's an unchecked, unfettered economy ecosystem and that the discounting is too deep, you actually reach to a point where nobody can actually make any money. And if nobody's making any money doing it, then as consumers, that bike helmet might disappear from the market because the retailer can't afford to sell it if they are constantly losing money on it. And that's the only way they can sell that product. Um, it just doesn't make sense. Um, and then if they can't sell it, then as a manufacturer, then we can't really produce that product anymore and, and distribute that product anymore because there's nobody to buy it. Uh, and so it just becomes this, this unhealthy ecosystem. And so the, there has to be a, a balance 
balance there. There has to be some profitability for the people involved in the process. Otherwise, it just doesn't make, make it worth their time and their while. Next slide. So in the end, what this comes down to sometimes is what we refer to in the industry as a race to wholesale. And it's kind of that concept of that last man standing where they'll, you know, if, if it's unfettered and unchecked at some point in time, there's always somebody out there who's willing to take, you know, I, I'm happy to only make a penny on this product as long as I can sell 10 million of them, right? Because, you know, it, it, would, it allows them to make a fairly amount of profitability, but they have to do a lot of volume. And so uh, if everybody keeps saying, oh, I've got the lowest price and I've got the lowest price and I've got the lowest price, at some point, there's only one person. And once it gets to that point in time as manufacturers, we can't afford to stay in business or make that product or distribute that product anymore. And so those products just disappear. And so some, sometimes your favorite products just disappear because, you know, everybody just raced to the bottom and then nobody could sell the product anymore. And there's just no healthy ecosystem for it to be available out there. So, you know, where on one hand as consumers, we, we might look at map as something that's like, well, hey, that doesn't help me. I want the cheapest price possible. We all do. And we all want to be uh, responsible with our with our income. But we have to look at the health of the ecosystem. And if it's unhealthy, then the items just disappear and the availability of those products, goods and services will disappear with it. So I think that's about it for me, I believe. Thanks, John. Um, that, uh, thanks for the, yeah, the basic lesson on, on the economics of, of retail sales. And uh, you know, kind of bringing it in perspective, right? As a consumer, we always want the best deal and want to chase that best deal. But you know, that's not always uh, the best solution. So um, I want to pass it over to, to John LeBaron because Pattern is, you know, the leader in helping to fight this race to wholesale. They, you know, they have solutions for their clients and things like that to help prevent this either, you know, a, a monopoly or, or a race to the bottom or, or whatever it is, um, you know, solutions to help us keep a really healthy economy in the retail space in e-commerce and for uh and for brick and mortar stores as well so john i'll, I'll give you a little bit of time i think we you have a few slides we'll pull those back up and uh let you go for a minute yeah thanks a ton india yeah you can feel free to pull those slides back up and i can guide you through them but john thanks a ton for walking us through that master class on uh, on map and you know as pitt mentioned we also you know, we're massive advocates of MAP. We help brands set up MAP policies, or rather we have partners uh, with law firms that help set up MAP policies. Um, but, you know, we're, we're massive fans of it. We always adhere to MAP. Uh, we think it's the secret sauce for brands. And our kind of shtick is we help brands grow profitably on global e-commerce platforms. And um, because, you know, to John's point, you can grow, you just cut the price and you, you'll you sell more units. But if all those units are unprofitable, um, then you're gonna go out of business. So it's really critical that brands, you know, we can help educate them and, and really help them kind of grow. I think e-commerce definitely has exacerbated this issue of race to wholesale. And I'll go through a couple of examples as to why, but I think it's important you know, for anyone, whether you own a brand today, whether you're in retail, whether you work for a brand, whatever it looks like, that you kind of understand a couple of principles and paradigms here. So the first one is this success offline in brick and mortar in retail, et cetera, traditional retail requires scale distribution. You know, if you're working for a brand, almost always you're trying to get into as many doors as possible. Retail distribution points that could be Best Buy. It could be Shields. It could be Cabela's. It could be you know, REI, whatever, but, but it's about getting into more doors. If you're going to be successful in this new online world, um, you actually want to limit that distribution. You don't want a ton of online sellers uh, for reasons we'll get to, but you know, we represent a number of brands here on the right, like Kong and Sorrel and pop sockets and black diamond. Uh, but we do not represent anchor and Nike anchor just went, you know, public for eight and a half billion dollars on the Shenzhen stock exchange. If you go to buy anchor, products online on Amazon, for example, they sell, you know, a lot of phone chargers and whatnot. You can only buy them from one place and that's Anchor. A Anchor sells them directly, right? Nike just pulled their 1P or their, their first party relationship with Amazon. Last year, you could Google Nike Amazon fiasco or something and read all about them pulling out of a, a direct relationship with Amazon because of these issues um, that scale distribution in the online world kind of represents. So if you go to the next slide here, 
Um, what ends up happening if you have multiple sellers and, and a lot of people don't, a lot of people know this about eBay, but they don't necessarily think about it with Amazon. They think when they buy something from Amazon, they're buying it from Amazon. But really 60% of all the products sold on Amazon are actually going through third party sellers. Um, and, and Pattern is actually one of those third party sellers. We're actually the largest seller on Amazon of health and personal care products. And we're within the top three sellers out of, you know, 4 million sellers on Amazon today. We're in the top three from a revenue perspective. Um, and so we know this space very well, but what ends up happening if you have too many sellers kind of competing to win what we call the buy box, that is like where you push add to cart on Amazon, that is called the buy box. And you'll see different names shuffling in and out of there. It'll say, you know, sold by, you know, anchor fulfilled by Amazon or sold by Jim's backpacks and fulfilled by Amazon or sold by sleepingbags.com or whatever. Um, you know, this is kind of a rotating round robin situation in, in that area of Amazon. But if you have too many of those, there are incredible, there's incredible downward pressure for those sellers to compete on price. Because if you have 10 sellers um, in this, you know, competing, selling their, their wares, you know, that, that's potentially healthy competition. But if they're all selling at map, Amazon's basically going to do a round robin. If you're all selling at the same price, you're going to get 10% of those sales. If you lower your price to the market and back to John's question, if you're willing to make a penny, if you lower that, let's say the map on that bicycle helmet was $60, everyone selling at $60, you're going to get 10% of the sales. If one of those drops to even $59.99, they're going to get hundred percent of the sales and everyone else is going to be selling for 60. And so of course what that, the next person's going to lower theirs to $59.99 and they're going to split 50, 50. And if one of them drops $59.98, they're going to get 100%. So there's tremendous downward pressure in these online marketplaces and eBay, Walmart.com, even Target.com launched their own marketplace. These are all marketplaces that multiple sellers can go and compete. And when that price erosion starts to happen, you get complaints from brick and mortar uh, you know, partners, as you can see in number one here. Uh, you get brick and mortar partners threatening to decrease your self presence. And again, this is important because you know, at least in a pre-COVID world, about 82, 83% of all sales are still were still going through brick and mortar stores. And so if you have Walmart calling you and saying, what the heck, why is this bike on sale on Amazon for, you know, 20% off what I'm selling at, I'm going to now have to match that price on Amazon and you're going to have to fund the difference. And so we have a lot of brands coming to us in a tailspin like, Oh my gosh. I mean, we had a massive electronics manufacturer that was paying Best Buy half a million dollars a month in just, you know, rebates and basically price match guarantees because Best Buy was competing to match the Amazon price. And this manufacturer was like, I don't even know who it is that's selling. It wasn't Amazon that's selling it, the low price. It was, you know, who, whatever, uh, you know, Bill's, Bill's electronics shop was selling it for cheap. And so they couldn't even figure it out. So, this is a massive pain point. And if you're in this world, you know that very, very well. If you go to the next slide here. Um, so to, to, what ends up happening is what we call this profitability death spiral. So on the right, on number one, e-commerce starts booming. Then a bunch of third party sellers flock to the marketplace to, to hawk those goods. The competition between those, which I mentioned earlier, drives down those online prices. And number four, uh, you know, the brand loses control of that buy box. Instead of having Amazon there or instead of selling it themselves and they're winning all those sales, all of a sudden these bottom feeder, you know, distributors or, or people in the chain that got access to their product, you know, they're, they're losing control of that buy box. Then brick and mortar is starting to match those prices online and your retail profits start to erode because you're having to, you know, fund all these price match guarantees or rebates or concessions. Um, and ultimately then your e-commerce profits erode because suddenly, you know, there's this race to wholesale and you know, if, if the, if the helmet you bought for $30 and we're trying to sell for $60 is now $45, you can't actually, you know, run that profitably anymore. So you're going back to the head, you know, helmet manufacturer and saying, Hey, you know how I used to buy this for 30? Well, profits have eroded, prices have eroded. I need to now buy this helmet for 20. And, and, and number eight, the, the punchline is all of your channels become less profitable. And so as a brand, you have got to get ahead of this and figure out how to get into control. So if you go to the next slide, I'm going to get kind of kind of go deeper into this. The, the punchline and the trick to this is you've got to rationalize your distribution on e-commerce. You've got to get back to that initial slide where I talked about, 
you know, really limiting your distribution on e-commerce, which will stabilize the price of your products. And then you've got to find someone who's an expert that could be internally, that could be going straight to Amazon. It could be working with an agency. It could be working with someone like Pattern um, to really get you into a growth, profitable growth position. So again, I'm just going to go through a handful of quick slides and we'll open it up for questions. But if you go to the next slide again, India, um, I think it's important to understand how kind of this works. And so at, at a high level, you know, there's something called the first sale doctrine. And the first sale doctrine is an actual law. And I actually updated a couple of slides, but maybe they're not updated here. It doesn't really matter. But, you know, the first sale doctrine is basically a law that says, hey, if you buy something, you can resell it without repercussions. And that's a really healthy law in the U.S. that allows people to operate on eBay, on Amazon. Even you could, you know, you could buy a pair of skis and sell them out of your garage, KSL.com, obviously. That is what allows a lot of those marketplaces to thrive. Um, and that's what, you know, how you kind of get out of control on a marketplace is you may have a ton of different sellers. If you go to the next slide, an important thing to understand is that the first sale doctrine does not apply if it ends up compromising the quality of the product to the end consumer. And so, you know, normally a brand could go find out, you know, some sleeping bags.com is selling sleeping bags on Amazon and say, hey, you're not allowed to sell these on Amazon, you know. And that person's likely going to come back to the brand and say, no, I got the first sale doctrine. I can sell these. It doesn't matter. You can't control this. Well, the courts have ruled in many cases that if, you know, for example, if the sleeping bags are, are being stored with in a chicken coop <laughs> or, I, or I don't know if they're, you know, this happens a lot in vitamins and supplements and consumables, for example, you know, some some sellers are, are, are storing these supplements in their garage in Phoenix in the summer and it's 140 degrees in that garage. And it's actually, you know, hurting the, the, the quality and the efficacy of those vitamins. And so the courts have ruled, listen, um, if there's a material difference between what you're selling, even if it's new, quote unquote, versus, you know, what what the brand is selling new, then you're going to you're, you're not actually the first sale doctrine does not apply. And so and these differences do not need to be um, physical differences. If there are material difference, you could say, hey. Jim's sleeping bags is selling sleeping bags, but they do not include my warranty because it's a it's technically a resale. And if Jim's not willing to abide by my warranty, he's not allowed to sell. And so there are ways to kind of you know structure this in order to clean up this distribution. So again, you can go to the next slide here. So this is what we help brands do on this. We call this a profitability flywheel. If you've kind of gone down the spiral and your prices have started to erode, this is what we do. And it starts at the very top at noon on this slide with what we call selective distribution. So you get into a position where you say, I only want one distributor on my online channels or, you know, three or four. And that creates that price stability because hopefully all those, you know, distributors and pattern again, kind of would fall under this. We hold map. And if we don't hold map, the brand yanks us and, and doesn't ship to us anymore. And so it's really imperative that we always hold that map price on Amazon. That creates more leverage with retailers, which again, are 80% of your business is going through brick and mortar. And that creates more leverage there because you can leverage, you know, hey, I want better shelf space. Look at my prices online. Look at my competitors. Look at this other bike helmet. You know, their prices are 20% off on Amazon and mine are the same price. Walmart might even be cheaper than Amazon. So that gives you more leverage with the brick and mortar channel. That gives you better performance. That stabilizes that race to wholesale that John talked about. And then if you swing over to that left side of the screen, you know, then you get this buy box on Amazon instead of rotating through a bunch of sellers that are all, you know, kind of race to the race, the wholesale, you, you control that. And what ends up happening, at least on Amazon US, is if one seller controls that buy box, they have full right on all of the advertising and there's a ton of consistency and you really start to grow. And then you get concentrated investments in SEO and customer service. And these are all the things we do for the brands. But again, if you've got 20 sellers, they're all in it for themselves. They're all in it to try to get their pound of flesh. They're, they don't care about your images. They don't care about your customer service. They don't care about anything else. It's all about them and their price. When we're the one getting all the profits and we're the ones winning all that buy box, you know, we really care about improving the experience for the brand on that channel, about improving the SEO, about improving the advertising. And it works. I mean, that is why we call ourselves pattern is because we really feel like we figured out the pattern for helping brands attain profitable growth and control 
on these platforms. So if you go to the next slide real quick, India, and I think we just have two more, um, you know, Skull Candy is a fan favorite. They're, they're local, right? When they came to us, I think they had over 400 different sellers selling their product on Amazon. Right, it took eight long months, but we re rep, you know, we reached 94% compliance on Amazon with them, meaning that 94% of their sales on that platform, you know, when they approached us, it was like 2%. We got to 94% compliance, which all the sales were going through at Map, um, which is pretty remarkable. And uh, you know, an in increase in sales tends to follow. So on the next slide, same thing with Sylvania. Right, they reached 90% of compliance, meaning 90% of their sales on Amazon are now going through at the map price um, it, within six months. And then again, that's where that growth kind of comes into play. So we've worked with, we've helped grow, brands grow by selling at map from 3 million to 21 million, from 5 million to 54 million. Our biggest brand started working with us four and a half years ago, five years ago. And they were doing about $18 million a year on Amazon today. You know, this year they'll do over $100 million on Amazon. So I guess, you know, parting thought for me is it is absolutely possible to grow profitably, even in this environment um, and, and hold map without having to pull this lever of, you know, dropping the price to grow. You can grow within these channels. You just have to make sure you're, you're on top of your distribution that you understand and the, you, you know, you understand that how to kind of basically rationalize that distribution and, and illegalize the sale of your products through people who are not in it for you. And then ultimately you're working with a partner or, or doing it yourself in a way that there's a ton of expertise and you know how to maximize um, these platforms. And I would say not only in the U S but outside of Amazon, you know, Alibaba is three times the size of Amazon. People don't know that it's they're 10 times more profitable than Amazon. And so it's not just about doing that here in the U S it's what are the ripple effects in Southeast Asia and Japan and Canada and, and South America too. So anyway, I appreciate you guys uh, weighing in and, and I know this is a complex topic, but if you have any other questions, feel free to, to email me about it. Thanks, John. That was uh I, I mean, that's awesome. I think we've all seen that anybody that's worked in retail or work in the industry, selling a product has, has struggled with, you know, your product going wild on Amazon, you know, through all these different sellers and things. And so um, I want to I want to add or ask another question. You know, my experience, um, you know, back when I when I worked at Petzl, um, uh, you know, John Rockefeller, maybe you can help answer this right. It's a it's a time consuming process to track down map violations and reports and things. You know, you, you you we would have we'd have dealers call us and and or send us photos and say, look, this person's violating. You know, you know how how do you manage that? How you know it's a time consuming process, especially for a, a startup company that doesn't have the you know the bandwidth. How do you manage tracking down these violations and then kind of in, and enforcing them with online retailers plus your brick and mortar retailers, right? What, how do you tackle all that? Well, the reality is, in my opinion, it, you can't afford not to. I mean, and I think that's what we just talked about. You know, John kind of highlighted it. If you don't, it becomes a death spiral. And so you have to find a way to, to do the best you can. But it's a, you know, we call it a whack-a-mole game. Like you, you whack one and another one pops up and you hit that one and another one pops up. But it's just a, it's a constant monitoring. It's a constant um, being just vigilant and tracking it down to the best of your abilities. You know, many companies now have to turn to the fact that we actually have to put individual tracking numbers on, in, on each product, and then we know who we shipped that product to originally, and then once we buy it somewhere else, we can figure out, well, where did that product originally, who's our original dealer that we sent it to? Um, and then you can figure out where things are. You know, recently, last year, I, I was tracking um, some gray marketing on Amazon, actually on, on um, Sears.com, trying to figure out who was behind it. And it turns out that it was just a consumer who was buying product full price from one of our retailers and then just reselling it for a markup on another uh, marketplace. There's nothing illegal about that to a certain extent, um, but it's also just trying to understand the nature of where things are happening. So there's all these micro economies and, and micro revenue channels that are happening everywhere. But John's point is really important is the fact that when you don't monitor it and spend the time and effort to take care of your brand and your brand image, uh, at some point, it becomes uh, unhealthy for everyone involved, whether it's you as the manufacturer or the retailers involved as well. And in the end, it just becomes something where you could actually disappear from the marketplace altogether. So um, you just have to put the time and the effort into it. There are 
um, great online monitoring services that you can you know, hire. Uh, and so they actually have bots that will go out and look at, uh, across to whatever sites that you want to look at. And they will check your product listings on a regular basis. And they use complex algorithms to make sure they're checking it at different times of the day, different times of the week, et cetera. Uh, and they can constantly provide a report of, of who's selling your products at what price, where. Uh, and so you, you, can, you can hire services to do that, or you can actually you know, code it yourself if you have that expertise in-house. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, John LeBaron, I mean, as this relates, I mean, we've been talking about this now for 45 minutes, but as this relates to you know, third party partners, whether you're using third party logistics for distribution or, or additional reach or things like that, um, you know, what, I guess for a small business or a new startup, what's the most effective way that they can manage those relationships to make sure that one of those 3PL companies or partners doesn't run amok with, with their product? Yeah, it's such a good question. And I'll, I'll just kind of echo what John just shared and maybe just bring up this other you know, slide that I was going to share for a second, which is, um, you know, this is our software. We call it Predict. And, you know, there are a ton of other types of software out there. But literally, you can see this is for Sorrel, one of the brands we represent. It literally shows the number of products, how much ownership they have. If I were to click on this compliance tab, it would show you the number of products that are being sold by each of these sellers and how many of them adhere to map, et cetera. So it's not totally complicated and you can see the fall off. Like we're winning 56% of the sales right now for Sorel, which is pretty good. We just signed them, you know, two months ago, basically. Um, Zappos is, is huge and that one we expect, they're not gonna break up with Zappos. They're actually owned by Amazon. Um, but you can see what ends up happening is, you know, Backcountry owns a bit of it. And then you've got this fairly long tail. And so what I will say is even though it's a whack-a-mole game, um, we see this time and time again with you know, hundreds of different brands that you know, it's generally a select few that are causing most of the problems and the disruption. But it is, can be tricky to figure out, well, where are they getting the product? Did, you know, did, did they get it legally? Did they steal it? Did they, is it great? Is it authentic? Is it counterfeit? All that sort of stuff. And so, to me, the big takeaway is just, you know, don't try to solve this on the cheap. Um, it is so critical to your business that you've got to get into it with a partnership mentality. And so I guess my advice back to your question is, you know, don't work with shady people. You don't, you know, have a, a heavy hand. If you find like maybe give them one time of an offense, but it's like it's not even a three strikes you're out. It's like one strike you're out or two strikes you're out um, because you just you have to set this thing of like it will not be tolerated. And the brands that are willing to kind of, you know, and I've worked with brands that will shut Amazon down. They'll shut Best Buy down. They will shut Shields down, which is a little bit of a honestly, I don't know if this is a PC term or not, but it's a Mexican standoff, which is like whoever's going to flinch first. And I will tell you. If you're an important enough brand, if Petzl shut down their biggest distributor because they 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 messed up on map, like it sends this message of like, I'm not screwing around, like do not mess with me. So I think you have to be that. And it's hard, especially if you're a startup because you don't necessarily have that brand. Like no one needs you on their shelf. You wanna be on their shelf, but you've gotta set that up early and often. And, and that's why honestly you see so many brands starting with their own .com or their own D2C or even opening their own retail stores is because that control is just so imperative to the success. Great, thank you. All right, so we've let you guys talk for about 45 minutes and it's been super interesting. Uh, I, I, again, I, I think it's, it's, a great, it's a great reminder for us, even you know, some of us that have worked in the industry or worked in business for so many years, right? It's always great to have these basic uh, conversations and remember, what's important and, and, and what to focus on. And, and so thank you so much for your time. We have a question come up and I wanna encourage anybody else to throw in a question, please. Um, uh, so we can keep talking, we've got about 15 minutes available for questions for anybody else. So please put them in the chat. First question that came in is, as a consumer of outdoor products, what suggestions or recommendations do you have to support this model um, from a consumer standpoint? So as well as encourage others to do the same. You know, when there's such a strong pull to find the absolute lowest price for a product, 
you're trying to buy, right? I, I think we hear messaging around this a lot, you know, whether it's buy local or support your local gear shop or, or things like that as opposed to ordering everything off of Amazon. But as a consumer, you find yourself torn quite often. So um, yeah, how, how, how can we, how can we help to fight this, you know, profitability spiral um, for these companies? I'd love to jump in on that one. Uh, so great question, Robert. I, you know, I think we're all part of the solution and part of the problem, right? And so it's like any other ecosystem. Uh, my recommendation there is to choose wisely and just, you know, choose to buy certain things from certain people for, for key reasons, right? For example, like, some, it's very easy to, let's say, just buy everything from Amazon. And, and that's one solution. And you can do that. And there are, you know, that can be a part of the healthy ecosystem. Um, but when you when you go to that buy box and you choose who you're going to buy it from, let's say on Amazon, you can see that it's offered from whoever's on the page at that point in time. But then just below that, you'll see it's also offered from 13 other, let's say, resellers. And that's where you can look at that drop down list and say, OK, who on this list do I want to support? Um, you know, locally here in, in, in the Salt Lake area, we have Backcountry.com, who's one of our retailers as well, and they're, they're authorized to sell on the platform. And they sell on the platform for the same price as they sell on their website. And so if you want to support them, but you want maybe to buy it from Amazon for, you know, the free shipping or whatever you're getting there, if you're Prime, great, do that. But choose the, the reseller from that list of resellers that you want to support. Maybe you've relied on them for other advice in the past, or you've called their helpline, or you've gone to their retail store and asked for help and fitting something properly. You know, support the folks that, that support you to a certain extent. Um, certain things are definitely worth buying when they're on sale, right? Obviously, you know, uh, for most people, the higher the price point product, the more you want to find a discount on it. And that's that's normal. That makes sense. But for, you know, items that aren't quite so price sensitive, consider really like, can I buy that from somebody who um, I really trust and respect or I use their services for other things and I'm benefiting from having them as a local retailer or as a retailer that I work with online on a regular basis. And so it's, it's a conscientious decision that you can make to support the people that you know or that you want to support. So when you look at the drop down on any e-commerce site in a marketplace, you can pick the reseller that you want to buy that from and you can see what prices they're offering it at. Uh, and I think that's a great way, even if you are using the marketplaces, to help selectively choose the retailers that you want to support. And, and for a lot of people too, I think it's about the values behind that company. You know, there was a recent study in Snooze, which is an outdoor industry um, kind of um, press uh, outlet that was talking about the top manufacturers in our industry recently. And from the retailer's perspective, 17% of all the votes, the number one brand was Patagonia. And a lot of the people talked about how Patagonia, they really respected the, the values of the organization and how they help contribute to a better, uh, you know, a sustainable economy and uh, a sustainable uh, environment. And so again, another way you can decide where you're going to invest your dollars and invest your money. So. John LeBaron, do you have anything to add on that? Uh, no, I like that. I like John's idea around looking at those different sellers on Amazon. Um, and I think it's a noble question. Look, at the end of the day, brands themselves kind of are in the bed that they made um, because of this whole distribution thing. And so it's really on them. I, I think it's hard because, you know, listen, everyone is in the consumer's you know, camp because we're all consumers. And so, you know, this model benefits us as consumers. Uh, it benefits Amazon because Amazon is, you know, such a massive player and, you know, they've got Prime Video and, and you know, Amazon Web Services and they've got all these other things that help subsidize this retail model. And so in a way they can't afford to, to make a penny or even lose dollars on a lot of different items. And so they win. Who who ends up, who's in the brand's corner, right? The brand loses out. And so we we tend to think we're in that corner. but. Um, you know, the, the, the thing that I would say hurts retailers the most is this concept of showrooming. And we've all done it. Um, you walk in, you look at it, you try it on, and then you open up your phone and you literally buy it on Amazon and you walk out the door. That hurts the retailer. Um, I went and bought some backcountry boots yesterday, right? Like at a local company, they spent an hour fitting those boots for me. And I, I knew if I looked online, I'd be able to find them hundreds of dollars cheaper. But I was like, that is such a like jerk move. I'm just gonna buy them here at the retailer, right? Like they put in the time, they serviced me, like that is totally worth, and it was, I, like $400 difference. But it was like, for me, it was about that, supporting the local economy, supporting 
you know, the value exchange that actually happened. And I know if I've got an issue with those boots, I can take them right back and like, they're going to help me out. So I would just say, if there's one thing I can say is, you know, and again, it's different if you're like, just check, you're, you're going to buy something and you just check it and no associate has helped you. But I would say, you know, especially local businesses, if you go take a test ride of a bike, if you go, you know, try on that, like just freaking try to buy it from that store uh, versus like just showrooming them because it is, you know, I, like Home Depot gives wireless free access in one of the, in their stores. And one of the reasons they do that is they, they do it to check how many people are actually checking prices on amazon.com in their store while they're about to walk out. So um, again, I, I, we're all guilty of it to some degree, but, but that showrooming I would say is probably the most um, difficult behavior because what is happening is that local bike shop or ski shop or whatever is subsidizing the experience that Amazon cannot provide. And so my, my goal with the retailers is always, Hey, you know, as long as price is stable across all channels, let the consumer buy where they want. If they want to buy on Amazon because of Prime, cool. If they want to buy at their local store, cool. But do not incentivize bad behavior by having a lower price on Amazon that bleeds out your brick and mortar. So uh, I don't know. Those, those are my comments. And just to add to that, John, I would say, you know, if you, you know, are in that kind of dilemma where you've been, you're in the store and they've given you some help or you're in the store and their price is higher than what you can find online, it doesn't hurt to ask the store if they'll match the price online. Um, some stores will do that. Some stores, you know, they want to keep your business. Um, maybe they'll meet you halfway. Maybe they'll, they'll find another way to make it the right deal for you. So it doesn't hurt to ask. I, I always ask in those scenarios, especially if there's a big gap and you, and you really, you know, you just maybe can't afford to, to buy it at that price, but they've they've gone to the extra help and, and, and let you try it on or look at it or whatever. That's just a great way to give them, give them the opportunity to at least match the price. Great, thanks, John and John. Uh, uh, <laughs> very great suggestions there. We have one more question that have come in and then, and then we'll wrap things up here. Um, it's for John. I'm guessing uh, John LeBaron here, but it says trying to avoid the death spiral. What makes you know predict software unique, uh, you know, at pattern compared to the host of other bot-driven monitoring services to help reduce map violations? Yeah, good question. I mean, at the end of the day, we actually don't sell the software to people, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> like you can't just buy uh, predict. You kind of have to go all in with uh, with pattern. We're very much like a you know we don't date people. We just marry them off the bat. So it's it's that partnership, but, but at a high level, I mean, one of the things I think that is unique about our software um, that is not provided by other software is this notion of what we call first blood. So the hard part is if you're a brand and you notice Amazon is dropping the price, yes, you can go to Amazon and say, hey, I don't like that you're not adhering to my map policy. They're immediately going to say, we didn't lower the price, we just followed. Um, someone else lowered the price in our algorithm, just picked that up and, and lowered our price immediately. And so you get into this, like he said, she said sort of environment, same thing with Walmart. We didn't lower the price. Amazon dropped the price first, so we just followed. And it can be very, I guess, frustrating. And again, it's not always those. It could be CVS, it could be you know Nordstrom, it could be whatever. Um, but trying to like monitor and it's almost like being a parent with a bunch of kids who stole you know some snack or something like that. So uh, we have a, a feature within Predict Software that's called First Blood that literally shows the timestamp on when you dropped. And so you, the brands can actually go back to Amazon and say, no, 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 no. I see at 243 and 42 milliseconds, you actually dropped the price first and then Walmart followed. And so I need you to get up or we're gonna cut off your distribution. So um, again, it's, we don't really sell it, so it doesn't really matter. But, um, but I think there's a lot of innovation in this space. And honestly, there's a lot of good software out there. And at John's point earlier, it's just too much of a thing to ignore. We actually pay when we work with brands, we pay for all of their legal enforcement, right? Out of our own kind of margin, because it, to us, it is so important for the brands to get into control and it can be expensive. Like for some of our big brands, it's thousands of dollars a month, tens of thousands of dollars a month. We pay, you know, millions of dollars a year across all the 90 brands that we represent, but we do it because, you know, if the brand's like, oh, I don't really want to cut the, or it's expensive. And it's like, no, 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 it's, it's like, you have got to get into this it's almost like we're the personal trainer making sure we go and rip out all the crap out of their fridge and, you know, take their smokes away and all this other stuff. Cause it's like, you know, left to their own devices, um, the incentives, it's, it's, it's so hard to do it that we're willing to let that law firm come in and help 
clean up the channel for them and diagnose and do the test buys and, you know, track all these different things because, um, to John's point, it's, it, it's an uphill battle, but once you get it done, like look at Sylvania, look at skull camp, like we have a, 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 tro, tre, a chest of, uh, of stories here with brands that actually got to it that were, yeah, I remember when Panasonic came in, they were like, you will never fix this problem for us. We've been trying for five years. It will never happen. And then it was like sweet victory a year later to have that VP of sales in our office saying, damn it, you guys did it. Like, good job. You know, you got it. You got us to like 93% compliance. So it's, uh, it's beach body. You just got to get into it and, and you'll eventually get there. I see the next pattern commercial. It's a it's a shirtless John LeBaron going into people's businesses and and ripping out all the bad stuff in there. So. I wouldn't do that on anybody. <laughs> um, well, thanks for your time. Um, there, there was another question that came up, but we're we're running out of time here. So I encourage anybody on the call to reach out to J Rock or JLB directly and ask any questions. They're happy to answer. Um, and you know, I. I, I expound on on their you know massive knowledge that they've shared with us today i think it's really great information for anybody that's getting into this business um then feel free to feel free to reach out and, and talk to these guys because they're a great resource and really appreciate you all taking the time to 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 educate us today and and for everybody to participate so um thank you john and john i'll, I'll pass it over to india to close out real quick and everybody have a great day um again thanks for joining us and, and we'll talk to you soon Thanks, Pitt. And thank you both. I just noticed both Johns put their emails in the chat. So thank you for doing that. Okay, so I am going to do a drawing from those of you who asked questions. So we have got an outdoor prize for Jared Anderson. Hey, now. So <laughs> Jared, if you want to stay on the call till the end, um, I'll get your email from you and then follow up about getting that to you. Um, awesome. But Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and, and John and John and Pitt, thank you for moderating, of course. We really appreciate your time. Um, my cat has decided to start meowing. So with that, uh, thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, and we, we uh, enjoy you being a part of the Summit Speaker Series. Appreciate it, y'all. Take care.